Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India to the fourth lecture of uh, fifth module of this course called Game Theory in Economics. Uh, before we start this lecture, let me take you through what we have been discussing so far. We have been discussing extensive games. Uh, extensive games are those games where the actions are taken step by step, not simultaneously. So at one stage, some particular player might be taking some action uh, from, a, from a set of actions. And in the next stage, some other player might be taking uh, his or her action. And that is how the game progresses. And it may happen that a player uh, who took an action in stage 1 might be taking some action in stage 4 or stage 15. So it does not matter. Uh, there could be repetition of the same player in different stages. So uh, this is the general setting of a strategic, uh, of a uh, extensive game. And we have been discussing not extensive game in general, but extensive game with perfect information where every player uh, knows the actions of the other players which have been taken before uh, his action is required to be taken. Uh, we have also defined Nash equilibrium <coughs> in an extensive game. Uh, we have said that in a Nash equilibrium, in an extensive game, it must be the case that like in the case of strategic game, the, the strategy of every player adopts uh, in that Nash equilibrium should be such that if any player deviates from the strategy in the equilibrium, her payoff will not go up. And if her payoff does not go up, then there is no reason why any player should change his or her strategy from the Nash equilibrium strategy. <coughs> so this was the general definition. Uh, we shall do what we shall do today is to just check uh, how we have you we have understood the idea of Nash equilibrium by solving one problem, and uh, then we shall try to go beyond Nash equilibrium. So this is uh, one exercise of finding Nash equilibrium. Let me draw the game first. So this is uh, the game tree as we call them. Uh, you can see that here player 1 moves in two stages. In the first stage player 1 gets to move and he can take uh, action C or D. If he takes the action D the game ends there uh, where he gets 2 and uh, player 2 gets 0. If he takes the action C uh, then it is now player 2's turn to move who can either take the action E in which case the game progresses further again to player 1. But if player 2 takes the action F then the game again ends and uh, in which case player 1 will get 3, player 2 will get 1. And uh, if E is taken by player 2, then player 1 gets to move in stage 3 
and uh, the actions that he can choose from uh, are G and H. If G is chosen, then he gets 1, player 2 gets 2. If H is ch chosen, both of them get uh, 0 each. <coughs> now, suppose we want to find out what is the or what are the Nash equilibria in this game. <coughs> so, how shall we go about finding uh, the Nash equilibria? First, I shall try to find out the strategy set the set of strategies of player 1. Here the strategy set of player 1 is the following. This is the strategy set of player 1. They are the, the strategy set consists of 4 uh, strategies. C, G, which means that in the first stage uh, when the history is empty, he will take the action C. And uh, the meaning of G is that if the history is C E, then he will take the action G. So, that is the meaning of C G. Likewise, there is C H. Uh, so, at first stage he is taking the action C and in the last stage he is taking the action H. Uh, and there is DG and DH which means that uh, which has a problem of interpretation as we have seen before. Uh, what it means is that in the first stage when the history is empty, player 1 is going to take the action D and he is specifying that in case the history is CE uh, which is evidently ruled out by his own action D. Nevertheless, if the history is C E, then the action that he is going to take is G. So, that is the interpretation of D G, likewise D H. So, these are the four uh, strategies of player 1. And what about player 2? His strategy set consists of only two elements. Uh, he gets to move after the history C. So, either he can take the action E which is one strategy of his or he can take the action F which could be the other strategy. After we have uh, written down the strategy set of each player, the next step is to uh, you know find the uh, strategic form of this extensive game that is we look at this game as just like a strategic game. Uh, and if it is a strategic game, we can find out the Nash equilibrium <coughs> by drawing the payoff matrix. So, I write the strategies as actions and so once I have written them down, I can write the payoffs also. If I combine C G with E, the payoff is 1, 2, C G with F, basically the game is coming from this node to this node and going to this terminal history. So, this is 3, 1. C H E is 0 0, C H F is again uh, 3 1. Uh, if the strategy of player 1 consists of the action D, the obviously the game is ending in uh, this 2 0 itself, this terminal node itself. So, all this uh, payoff uh, uh, for this uh, strategy profiles will be 2 0. 
and uh, looking at it if I have to find out the Nash equilibria from this strategic form uh, then I know how to find it I have to look at the possible deviations from any uh, action profile and uh, we have to see if the, those deviations are profitable or not if they are not then we have a Nash equilibrium. So, by doing that I can see that this is a Nash equilibrium this is one and this is another. So, Nash equilibria are the following C H F D G E D H E and uh, what is the justification for this Nash equilibria? How we are certain that they are Nash equilibria? Well, we have to look at the de deviations and uh, if the deviations are not profitable then they are not Nash equilibrium. For example, let us take uh, this uh, strategy profile D G E T G and E. Now, why is this a Nash equilibrium? Uh, if player 1 is playing D and G then from player 2's point of view if he deviates uh, how can he deviate? He can deviate by playing F instead of playing E. But by deviating and by playing F uh, he is not improving his payoff because the payoff is remaining at 2 0. So, deviation is in this case not profitable. Therefore, from player 2's point of view he is doing the optimal thing. From player 1's point of view <coughs> there could be two sorts of deviations. One could be after the uh, empty history. Here if he deviates and chooses C instead of D uh, then given the other actions specified by this strategy profile we shall reach this terminal history C E G and uh, therefore he will get 1. 1 is less than 2 therefore uh, there is no point for 1 to deviate uh, as far as the action after empty history is concerned. Uh, what about this action G? <coughs> well, if he changes his action uh, and uh, takes up the profile, takes up the strategy D H instead of D G, uh, then his payoff is not improving because the payoff remains at uh, 2. So, uh, it does not matter if he changes this action from G to H and thus changing the uh, uh, thus changing the strategy of his his payoff remains at 2 0 uh, at 2. So, uh, uh, we can talk about other sorts of deviation of player 1 also he can deviate to C H for example, uh, but uh, C H is unprofitable uh, because in that case he will get 0 whereas now he is getting 2. So, uh, this is a Nash equilibrium strategy profile uh, likewise these two can also be shown uh, to be Nash equilibrium. <coughs> so, this is the def this was the definition and application of Nash equilibrium in uh, extensive game. But we have also seen in the previous lecture that uh, Nash, the idea of Nash equilibrium uh, in case of extensive game is a little problematic. Problematic in the sense that it is not robust, uh, it is not a very robust concept because there might be Nash equilibria where if a player deviates from the strategy that is specified in the Nash equilibrium strategy profile, then those deviations will generate 
non-optimal action or non-optimal strategies on the uh, on the other players. So this is something which we have seen before in the last class. So this was the familiar entry game. So this was the game, uh, there were two players, one is the incumbent, the maybe the monopolist firm in the industry uh, and there is a possible challenger, a new entrant, possible new entrant who will be called the challenger. And uh, if the challenger stays out, uh, then it is best for the incumbent, he gets two, the challenger gets one. If the challenger gets in, then uh, the incumbent might like to fight with the challenger, in which case it is worst for both of them, they could get zero each. Or the incumbent can choose to accommodate it, in which case the incumbent gets one because he is no longer the monopolist, uh, challenger gets two. In this setting, what we have seen that <coughs> Uh, there were two Nash equilibria. I am just repeating uh, the, the, the conclusions that we have drawn in the last class, last lecture so that uh, we can link up to the uh, discussion of this lecture. One was in and accommodated, the other was out and fight. Uh, there were no problem as far as in and accommodate is concerned, but what we have seen is that there was a problem as far as out and fight is concerned. Out and fight is a Nash equilibrium, there is no doubt about it because uh, given that the challenger is choosing out. Uh, the incumbent can choose either fight or accommodate, it, it will not make a difference to his payoff which remains at 2. So fight is absolutely okay. Uh, from the point of view of the challenger also, as long as the incumbent is choosing fight, the challenger is uh, uh, better off by choosing out because if he gets in there will be a fight in which case the challenger will get 0. So it is better for him to choose, uh, choose out and get one. However, <coughs> there was a problem of interpretation with this equilibrium. The interpretation problem was the following that in Nash equilibrium, the idea that we are invoking is the idea of a steady state, which means that I have been observing the behavior of the other players and by observing the behavior of the other players, I form a belief what their actions will be when I get to play with them and uh, those beliefs are proven to be true uh, when we actually play the game and that is how the game uh, progresses. But here when the game is structured in a sequential way, it is an extensive game. Uh, out fight is a strategy profile where the challenger never gets to see the action of the incumbent because he is staying out, because the challenger is staying out. So though uh, the incumbent is telling him I will fight with you, that action of the incumbent is never observed if the challenger stays out. And if there is no experience as far as the challenger is concerned, he cannot form a belief, a credible belief regarding the action of the incumbent. 
so there is a there, there is this problem of interpretation that you cannot see the action of other players where those actions are included in the strategy profile <coughs> and uh, one way to one way to rescue <coughs> the nash equilibrium concept in uh, such a, a dilemma is to say that okay i know that out and fight is the equilibrium and the challenger will choose out but it may happen that from time to time the challenger does some experiments he sometimes chooses to go in uh, so in those cases when he does the experiments uh, the incumbent chooses fight so these are observations these are real life observations so th th there are cases where the challenger gets in and the incumbent has fought with him therefore the challenger or the player who is in the place of the challenger uh, forms a belief that if he gets in uh, the incumbent will fight with him that is the strategy of the incumbent right the strategy of in incumbent is fight which means that if you get in i'll fight with you and which uh, the challenger gets to see by experimenting from time to time so that could be one way of rescuing <coughs> the idea of nash equilibrium in extensive games but in this case that uh, path that way out is not open to us why because if the challenger indeed gets in by experimentation or whatever maybe by error also uh, the incumbent will find it suboptimal to fight with him because if he fights he gets zero whereas if the incumbent accommodates he gets one which is more than zero so even if we uh, try to interpret this nash equilibrium uh, where the, the the players can do some experiments can make some errors and reach to the to the actions uh, takes the actions which are uh, not the equilibrium actions uh then the action specified by the other player is not optimal which means that this idea itself that this this is nash equilibrium all right but this idea this this nash equilibrium itself is not a robust equilibrium it's not a robust steady state because if some player deviates then the action of the other player which is specified by this nash equilibrium profile is not optimal that's why it is not a robust steady state all right so we have to have a more robust more reasonable concept of equilibrium if we have to deal with uh, extensive games with perfect information uh, a notion of equilibrium a notion of steady state which is more reasonable more logical and more uh, the, the term that i have just used robust than the idea of simple nash equilibrium so the idea that we shall develop now is what is known as sub game perfect nash equilibrium <coughs> uh to define this uh, new concept of equilibrium which is a little bit more than the idea of nash equilibrium let us first define what is a sub game so we have to define what is a sub game of a game and once we have defined what is the sub game of a game then we have uh prepare the ground to define what is a sub game perfect nash equilibrium so let me go to the definition <coughs> this is the definition <coughs> let uh, gamma be an extensive game with perfect information with player function p 
so uh, if you remember p is a player function which is applied over non terminal histories and if i apply p over h h is a non terminal history that then it gives me the identity of the player whose turn it is now to move to make to take an action for any non terminal history h of gamma the sub game gamma h uh, following the history h is the following extensive game so suppose there is a sub history or what is known as a non terminal history h of gamma uh, then corresponding to, to, to this non terminal history h there is a sub game which we shall call as gamma h and it is defined as the following now uh, this gamma h itself is a extensive game so it has to have four uh, elements which we have to specify the first is the player set <coughs> so this is element number 1 the players in this gamma h is the, 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 the players is the set of players in the original game that is the original game gamma second element that has to be specified is the set of terminal histories <coughs> so how are the terminal histories of gamma h uh, defined the set of all sequences h dashed this h dashed the notation has not come uh, really uh, properly so uh, how is it defined the set of terminal histories the set of all sequences h prime of actions such that h h prime is a terminal history so uh, h is a non terminal history of the original game gamma from h if there are maybe n number of uh, sequences of actions h prime such that h h prime is a uh, valid terminal history then every such h prime will be a terminal history in the uh, in the sub game gamma h <coughs> thirdly i have to specify uh, the, the player function uh, it is very simple the player p h h prime is assigned to each proper sub history h prime of a terminal history and uh, fourthly the preferences uh, this is simple each player prefers h prime to h double prime if and only if she prefers h h prime to h h double double prime in the uh, game gamma so uh, in that sub game that we are talking about which we have defined as gamma h suppose there are two uh, terminal histories <coughs> h prime and h double prime then uh, any player will like h prime to h double prime if in the original game h the same player prefers h h prime to h uh, h double prime so these are uh, quite intuitive ideas that we are talking about uh, basically what if i have to draw a diagram it will look like the following suppose this is the original game here the game is starting and after some point of time suppose the game reaches here and this is h <coughs> after h has happened the part of the game that is left after h has happened is called the sub game of the original game okay. so uh, that is the idea so the player that's why the player set remains the same uh, in general this is generalization the number of players the, the, the players that are there in the sub game uh, can at most uh, be the original player set of the original game so we can say that the player set of the sub game is same as the player set of the original game uh, and uh, terminal histories as i told as we have just said that all sorts of terminal histories where h 
H prime is a valid terminal history in the original game, uh, then H prime is a terminal history in this new game that we are defining, which is which we are calling as a sub game. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the the uh, layer function uh, for any terminal history H prime. <coughs> Uh, the player function p h h I can apply this uh, player function over this p h h prime over every sub history of this uh, terminal history h prime, and uh, those player functions, uh, those that player function will be same as the player function in this new sub game, and uh, finally the preferences. If there are two terminal histories, H prime and H double prime, and if any player likes H H prime to H H double prime, then he is preferring H prime to H double prime. Again, this is very intuitive. <coughs> so this is how uh, the sub game, the idea of sub game, is uh, defined. Some notes first the sub game following the empty history phi is the entire game itself. This is uh, this is again uh, very easy to see, and all other sub games are called proper sub games. So, if I take this history to be H, that is this then we are talking about this entire game itself. The entire game uh, is coming after uh, this sub game, after this history phi. So, uh, the game itself is a sub game of it, uh, its own, mm, uh, but there are other sub games in a game also and all those other sub games will be called proper sub game. So, uh, it is like a set and its subsets the set itself uh, is a subset of its own that we know, uh, but if I take that subset away, then the subsets that are remaining with me are called proper subsets. So, that is how it is uh, defined. <coughs> now, let us take some examples and see how uh, we can find out the sub, uh, the sub games from a from any game. So, let us take this game. Player 1 has 2 actions. And I am not writing the uh, the payoffs of the players because they are not very relevant. Uh, here, uh, how many sub games are there? There are three sub games here. One sub game comes after the empty history itself, which is the entire sub game. That is one game, sub uh, one uh, sub game. Uh, if I take the history C, then this is what is remaining with me, the part of the game that remains with me. So, this part is another sub game and this is a proper sub game, uh, not uh, unlike the sub game that we have just uh, specified before. And after the sub history, after the history D, we have this other sub game of the original game which starts uh, with 2 making the first move and uh, after 2 makes the moves uh, whatever move it is the game ends there. So, this game has 3 sub games, <coughs> but it may happen that these 2 proper sub games are not uh, are, are sub games of each other. Here these 2 proper sub games are not uh, sub games of each other, but it may happen that the proper sub games are also sub games of each other. Uh, let us take this game. 
uh, in fact I have drawn this before so let's take this game how many sub games are there now I claim that here also there are three sub games uh, the first sub game is very easy to see the game itself which comes after the uh, history phi then there is a sub game which comes after the history c which is this and uh, there is a sub game which comes after the non terminal history c e which is this so here i have three sub games okay so i have defined sub game and the next step is to define what is known as a sub game perfect nash equilibrium <coughs> Uh, the idea let me first try to uh, motivate the idea of a sub game perfect Nash equilibrium and then I shall try to define it more concretely more methodically uh, the idea of sub game perfect Nash equilibrium is this is that it is a like uh, the Nash the idea of Nash equilibrium in a in an extensive game it is also a strategy profile but the speciality is that this strategy profile should be such that it generates equilibrium in every possible sub game and uh, in particular also in the sub games which are not included in the terminal history uh, generated by the strategy profile. Uh, so, what I exactly mean by this can be illustrated by the following example. This is the familiar uh, entry game entry game once again. And in this game, we have seen that uh, out fight was a Nash equilibrium. The question is, is this a sub game perfect Nash equilibrium? And uh, the answer is no. The reason is that here the what is the terminal history which is generated by this uh, strategy profile? It is this out. Uh, but this game has a sub game which is not reached by the terminal history which is this sub game and this sub game is occurring after the after the history is in and what is the action or what is the strategy specified by this equilibrium profile uh, in this sub game in this sub game the the equilibrium profile is telling us that the incumbent will fight okay. uh, and the point is this, this this action this action of fight is not equilibrium in this particular sub game. So, in this particular sub game if the incumbent has to move and he has to choose between fight and accommodate accommodation is be better than fighting because accommodation gives him 1, fighting gives him 0. Therefore, this is, this is not an optimal action, uh, this is not an optimal strategy for uh, the incumbent player 2. So, that is why we say that this is not a sub game perfect Nash equilibrium in the sense that this strategy profile is not generating equilibrium 
in this sub game in this sub game following uh, the history in <coughs> likewise if i have to consider any strategy profile as a possible candidate for sub game perfect nash equilibrium i have to look into every possible sub game of that entire game and uh, check whether the strategies of the players uh, in that strategy profile uh, generate equilibrium in those each and every uh, sub game so that is uh, that is what one means by sub game perfect nash equilibrium but remember what i have done so far is just to give uh, an illustration a uh, vague definition but now i shall go to uh, more concrete and methodical definition and here is the definition so sub game perfect nash equilibrium is defined as the following that for each for every player i and uh, every history h after which it is players i is turn to move this has to be satisfied sorry this uh, let me write it down separately this subscript is creating a problem this should be the proper notation uh, similarly this should be o h s okay now uh, what we are saying is the following is that suppose s star is a sub game perfect nash equilibrium then s star must satisfy this condition for each player and uh, for each player and for each uh, non terminal history h so suppose i take any normal non terminal history h and i uh, by applying this player function i see this is the case that is it is now player i is turn to move then it must be the case that this should happen which means that uh, uh, if player i takes the action s i star and other players are taking their action s 1 star s 2 star etc etc uh, then the game will reach some terminal history after h has happened right and that terminal history is uh, indicated by this o h s star so this is where what is it, this is saying here ohs is the terminal history consisting of h followed by sequences of action generated by s after h so in, if i take any strategy profile s and uh, any uh, non terminal history h then ohs giving me that terminal history which is generated by this strategy profile after h has happened after this non terminal history h has happened so here we are talking about this equilibrium uh, strategy profile s star uh, i take any non terminal history not necessarily on the path of the equilibrium terminal history which is important i take any uh, uh, non terminal history h and uh, after h has happened i see now it is i turn to move then it must be the case that i is taking an action s i star which is optimal for him in the following sense this sense that if he changes his action uh, s this is this should be s i if it changes his action to s i then his payoff uh, cannot be more it can either be less or equal and that's why uh, taking this action s i star is optimal and this is true for every player i whose turn it is to move after every h uh, which is just an arbitrary non terminal history 
So this is the definition, <coughs> the precise definition of uh, uh, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Uh, just to repeat uh, the main point of the definition, uh, we have this S star, which is the profile, equilibrium profile, strategy profile. Uh, and I know that every strategy profile generates a terminal history. What is important about this subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is that I do not consider only those sub histories on the path of this particular terminal history generated by S star alone. I take into account every possible non terminal history H and uh, I take I look at the player whose turn it is to move after H has happened and I look at the terminal history generated by the S star after that H has happened and I try to see whether the action chosen by I is optimal or not. If it is optimal then I have got the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So that is the, the, the basic idea. Now I can apply this idea as I told you in case of different games and try to see whether the, the, the Nash equilibria that we are talking about uh, are subgame perfect or not. So, in this uh, entry game, there were two Nash equilibria, one was in and accommodated. Another was out and fight. Now let us see whether they are Nash equilibrium, whether they are subgame perfect Nash equilibrium or not. I uh, try to give give the impression that out fight is not a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Uh, but before going into that, let us do more systematically and. Let us look at in and accommodate. Is this a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium? <coughs> now I know this in this game there are two subgames. Uh, one is after H, one subgame, and after in. This is subgame one and this is subgame two. So, there are two uh, histories to be considered after phi and after in. <coughs> uh, now, one thing which is important, which is interesting is that remember that after the phi itself, the sub game that we are considering is the game itself. And in that game, which is just we are start. We are looking at the game from the from the point zero. Uh, that subgame itself is the game, and we know that in that game, the Nash equilibrium is already in and accommodated. So after phi, I need not check whether in this subgame uh, there is Nash equilibrium or not, because I already know that in the game, the entire game as a whole. Uh, in accommodate is a Nash equilibrium. So, the only thing I need to check is that after the history in uh, that is in this sub game are we getting a Nash equilibrium or not. If we are getting a Nash equilibrium there then we have got Nash equilibrium in every possible sub game and we are through. So, uh, here I can forget about this. So, this is the crucial thing that we need to look, look at. Now, here H is in all right, and uh, what is the equilibrium strategy profile? It is in and accommodated. <coughs> and how, uh, what is the uh, payoff of the first player that is the challenger? 
So, let us call this as UCH the challenger in uh, in the sub game following the history in it is uh, given by in and accommodate which means he is getting 2 and what is the payoff of the incumbent in equilibrium it is 1. So, this is what they are getting in equilibrium point is is this optimal if they deviate will they get better well uh, if player 1 deviates if player 1 deviates and changes his strategy to out, so so I have out now and the player 2's action strategy remains the same which is accommodate, then what does player 1 get? He gets 1 because this is what is happening now. So, uh, it is suboptimal for player 1 to deviate. What about player 2? That is uh, the incumbent. Here he can deviate and he can choose to fight. That is the only deviation that he can do. Uh, if he chooses to fight, he gets 0. So, which is less than 1. Therefore, we have the result that E accommodate is a Nash equilibrium, is a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium because it is generating equilibrium in every possible subgame after every possible history, non terminal history. What about out fight? So, if I talk, if I am talking about out fight, this is the thing that I am considering history. I know if the history is phi then it is Nash equilibrium. So, I that is what we have seen before, but if the history is in then I have to check whether this is equilibrium or not. Uh, so, if the history is in how much are the players getting? Uh, he is staying basically out here. So, he is getting 1. The incumbent in equilibrium is getting 2. If he deviates, now if he deviates, how can he deviate? He can choose to come in. So, in and fight. And if he comes in and there is a fight, he will get 0. So, it is not optimal for him to come in. So, that is all right. So, for uh, player, uh, the first player, the challenger, it is in fact optimal for him to stay out. But now, let us look at the incumbent. Now, he can choose to accommodate it. Right. Now, here if he accommodates, all right, he will get 1 if uh, h has happened that is then he will get 0, right. If h has happened that is uh, the in uh, in action has taken place, uh, then if he fights he gets 0, but if he accommodates all right, uh, then he gets 1 <clears throat> uh, and uh, so for player 2 that is for the incumbent after H has happened, so after in has happened, if he sticks to his strategy he gets 0, but if he deviates and accommodates he gets 1 which is better. Uh, for player 1 that is for the for the challenger. Uh, if he sticks to his strategy which is basically out 
uh, he gets one and uh, if he chooses to fight sorry if he gets chooses to get in then he gets zero so it is optimal for the challenger to stay out but it is not optimal for the incumbent uh, to fight and therefore uh, out fight is not sub game perfect Nash equilibrium. So, this is one way to show that the sub game the idea of sub game perfect Nash equilibrium can be applied to cases where the the the, the game the, the equilibrium Nash equilibrium is not robust the, the Nash equilibrium is generating outcomes where in sub games which is out of the uh, terminal history generated by the equilibrium strategy profile the actions of the players are not optimal and in the, those cases we can use the idea of subgame perfect Nash equilibrium to rule out those Nash equilibrium. Uh, so, let me conclude here itself and uh, in the next uh, lecture we shall talk about other facets of subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Thank you. Explain subgame perfect equilibrium. Why is it a more suitable way of looking at steady state in extensive games with perfect information? Subgame perfect equilibrium. Uh, Subgame perfect equilibrium uh, essentially what it means is that it uh, induces okay, equilibrium. in each possible sub game of the entire game. So, technically what we are trying to say is that for every player i and every non terminal history H after which I is to make a move, we must have U i O h S star This is the definition. Uh, what we are saying is that subgame perfect in subgame perfect equilibrium, it is not only the case that the game as a whole is in equilibrium, that in the beginning of the game the strategies chosen by players are optimal, but the optimal strategies are there for each and every po possible sub game. Even in those sub games, uh, which sub games are not touched by the equilibrium strategy of each player. So, there might be some sub game which is not reached by S star small s star, but in those sub games also uh, the strategies of players must be optimal. So, one example will make it more clear. In the extensive game depicted, depicted above, which are the sub game perfect equilibrium? We have talked about this uh, game before. Okay, so, this was the game 
uh, and we have seen that Nash equilibria in this game uh, are 4. these are the four Nash equilibria and we have seen uh, that in of out of all this Nash equilibria uh, B f c was a little bit problematic we said that there was a interpretation of whether this is a steady state. Now, we are now going to show that this is not a sub game perfect Nash equilibria not S p e why uh, let us look at the history uh, A C. Okay. Now, after A C has happened is the strategy of player 1 optimal that is the question that we are asking. <coughs> uh, after A C has happened what we are saying by this strategy profile B f c what player 1 is getting if uh, he plays according to B f c is 0, but now suppose he deviates and he plays B e c B e c then he is going to get 1. Therefore, uh, B f c is not subgame perfect equilibrium. 